know, uh, on this platform. Uh, we, uh, this is Alice, you know, uh, the moderator here, and uh, from Peking University. Actually, everyone know me as, uh, you know, a moderator on this, and for a long, 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 long time, looks very, uh, you know, familiar with you, but today it's my honor to, you know, host this Young Scientist session, and uh, we have uh, three superstars, and uh, for the talk about the next generation molecular diagnosis, I think this topic was very, very hard this time. So most of people want to know what's going on for the next, uh, you know, generations we can use and fast uh, and, uh, you know, uh, this diagnosis. So uh, three speakers was from different part and different universities. So they will share the experience. And uh, our first speaker is In Hao, was from uh, Wuhan University. And Hao was uh, a graduate from Nanjing University first, and then he traveled to US for a PhD, and then did uh, in uh, Colorado, and then he moved to MIT as a postdoc. So uh, he moved back to Wuhan in 2019. I uh, think then he made a big chance, you know, to working with these new technologies as a real applications because COVID, COVID is coming. So this technology has more, much more kind of uh, platform, to, uh, platform to be used. So how was uh, uh, good at and uh, the ed uh, gene editing and RNA therapy and developing efficient diagnosis technology for the disease using CRISPR and the next editing method. So uh, really uh, developing some new technologies and the platform technologies for this you know, uh, new field. And uh, he published many prestigious uh, uh, papers on the super you know, journals like uh, Natural biomedical, natural method, and the natural chemical uh, biology. So, how? Huh, yeah, we couldn't wait into hear your stories, please. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, let me share my screen first. Okay, is that okay to share my screen, uh, Alice? Okay. Uh, come in. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I was really appreciate. Um, uh, Alice, thanks for uh, for her introduction and for her invitation, and uh, also thank uh, Dr. S Dr. Song Jian and Ling Zhao for his invitation as well. And I also thank the audience for your patience to listen to our talk for this on great online seminars. So today, I like uh, to share with you a few uh, work we did in the past uh, a few years about. Uh, CRISPR technology and uh, its application for detection of pathogens uh, and how we uh, involve these technologies uh, in the past a few years and how we try to hopefully try to translate in, in the future. So uh, let me first introduce um, a, few a few technologies for diagnosis, uh, which very common use in the past uh, pandemic. So qPCR, as we know, is also the most Common use uh, molecular diagnosis uh, in in the lab, and uh, when you do a uh, uh, testing uh, for nucleic acids, which means the qPCR. But the, the advantage of this qPCR is very sensitive and very specific, but it also requires a lab lab environment, expensive and uh, equipment, and also a specific operator to uh, op operate the entire process. So. The waiting time I to ship your samples to the lab and waiting for results. So entire time at least take four hours and the uh, potential can last for one or two days. Alternatively, you can use a very fast called engine test uh, in, at home or anyone can operate that. It's very simple, fast. Uh, you can get the results in 10 to 30 minutes. And uh, it's quite cheap because it's working at the room temperature. But the downside of this um, Technology is, is sensitivity is quite low. So basically, it's about 500 to 1,000 lower folds of sensitivity compared with a qPCR. So, make it generating uh, a lot of false uh, negative results. And uh, uh, maybe also, maybe uh, Dr. Song will mention later. So, uh, 
a very common technology, also in particular working in the US and also other Western countries, it's called isothermal amplification in clinics. So basically, you have a, it's a very small machine and to uh, keep the temperature and to detect the, uh, some readout. It's very fast and very sensitive to detect uh, any nuclear acids or antigens, but, or, or any uh, pathogens. But the downside of this technology is the sensitivity, the specificity is some, in particular, some cases lower than desired. Uh, the best scenario maybe you have is about 10, 10% of the false positive results. And uh, the reason uh, emergent, I would say it's emergent technology happening uh, since 2018 uh, is called CRISPR based detection. So you apply a specificity of CRISPR to allow a fast and specific detection of any nuclear acids. However, the initial um, step or initial um, um, kit or based on uh, CRISPR is very uh, complicated. So let me show you here how, uh, how CRISPR best technology to recognize a specific nuclear acids. So CRISPR Cas, I, I use a Cas12 or Cas12A as an uh, example. So when Cas12A assemble is a CRISPR RNA, we would call a CRNA. Uh, you can recognize about 20 to 24 uh, nuclear acids to specific sequences, in particular uh, double strand DNA sequences. And these sequences must have uh, a pen motif uh, in it. The pen motif allow the Cas effector or Cas protein to dock uh, to the double strand DNA. So for Cas12A, or with kind of very common use, the Cas12A, the PAM sequence is a TTTV. So you have three T and a non T sequence here. So to four sequences to decide whether Cas12 can recognize the DNA or not. Then once the recognize and also CRNA a sequence, special sequence bind to the double strand DNA, it should initiate a specific cleavage we call cis cleavage. The cis cleavage will introduce double strand break of this DNA. Basically, you can see you can see that uh, this DNA will break down into two pieces, but that's not the end for the Cas12A. Cas12A or other some of other effectors in the CRISPR-Cas family has a specific, uh, a non-specific activity we call trans cleavage activity. Which once its specific activity is initiated, it will introduce very fast uh, called non-specific single strand DNA or RNA cleavage. So give an example here, if it, it may, can introduce 3,000 times of cleavage per second for this trans cleavage, massive trans cleavage activity. So if we provide a, a probe which can then, for instance, molecule and a quencher, this trans cleavage will break down the probe and release the, for instance, uh, molecule to introduce a for instance, signal. Uh, in the tube or in, can be read out by any machine or even by eye. So um, back to 2020, we have actually published in 2020, we have a, a paper come out to describe uh, usage of CRISPR-Cas for detecting a very deadly virus for the pigs. We call it uh, African swim, uh, swine flu virus. Um, we use a technology based on uh, a previous established by Jennifer Donna and the Fan Dan lab. So basically what we do is we get the DNA extracted, we uh, isosomal amplify the sequence, and to get enough amplicons, we open the tube and transfer a small article of the amplicons to the Cas12A reaction tube and waiting another about, let's say, 10, 20 minutes and to use a uh, laminar flow uh, detection method to see the to see the results. You can see the results are very clear. We can detect almost 100% of the spine flu and the sensitivity is as good as qPCR. So everything sounds great, but it's only one problem here is first, the, the process is complicated. How to do a lot of uh, articles, right? So transfer the liquid from one tube to another tube. But the most uh, frustrating thing is the contamination. So when we open the tube, after isosomal application, the, the amplicon seems like to flow or I would say to fly to everywhere in the, in the lab. Basically, every bench has these contaminations. Even, even did in a food will not eliminate this kind of 
lamination. So very frustrating. And uh, we have to do, as Fan Zhang Lab suggested, do this amplification in one, one room and do another process in different rooms. So this maybe can reduce the chance of amplification. So basically, what I said is as described in the 2018 uh, by uh, Jennifer Duna Lab, which is called two step detection. You first amplify the sequence, then you're using crisper cleavage from first trans cleavage, first cis cleavage, then trans cleavage to get the signal out. So back to um, about three years ago, uh, Jennifer Duna Lab has a, 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 a new version of crisper detection, basically called amplification-free detection. Do not amplify this sequence. And you can get a result in about one hour. But the downside of without amplification is that it's the sensitivity of such a detection is very low. Uh, down to the about CT value from 21 to 25, that's almost even lower than the engine test. So it's difficult to compete with other detection methodology in the market if we're using it this way. And uh, um, basically, within a year of the first uh, COVID-19 emergent, uh, Dr. Fan Zhang uh, at MIT also invented another, called, we call one pod reaction. Basically, combined the, the isosomal amplification and the CRISPR in one tube. In this case, you can get a result without, you know, cause contaminations and the, uh, also simplify the entire process. However, the downside of this, this uh, methodology is the sensitivity seems to be uh, significantly reduced from, let's say, equ equivalent to PCR to about 30 to 50 fold less sensitive than qPCR. And also, the reaction time seems to be longer than, than desired. About, it takes about one hour to in, make the entire process to be finished. So, before I start my uh, own, you know, some of the new uh, data to uh, emphasize the PAM sequence of cas 12 and how it's being used, uh, recognized. So if you have a double strand DNA, you have a TTTV, this is, can be recognized by cas 12 a protein, uh, which is using this called PAM interacting, interacting domain, with a PI domain. So this interaction is very specific and very potent to specifically recognize this uh, DNA containing this sequence. If the DNA do not, do not have any of this sequence, you will not start with any uh, recognition and uh, sub subsequently uh, cutting process. So um, back to the, uh, the year of um, you know, lockdown and uh, COVID-19 uh, initiation at Wuhan. In Wuhan, we, I started the experiment by myself. So let's say that's because no one in the lab allowed to come, come back. I have to do all the experiment myself. But initially, I tried to uh, combine the, the isosomal amplification technology called the RPA and the class 12A in one tube because we are familiar with these two technologies because uh, we use, uh, we have used it to detect uh, the ASFB virus. We com when we combine the tube, identify, I figure out is not, the signal is not very high. And it sounds like it's quite slow to get any signal out of the tube. And also, another part frustrating myself is that the signal is less, not stable. Even with this kind of curve, you will not get it every time. Maybe you can get one of the a few times to get this. And uh, this, you know, this is kind of um, make us think may, may not working in this way for combined for one part reaction. In particular, um, maybe something wrong here. So there's one time, uh, one of the students, basically you can see uh, uh, the first author of the paper, uh, Dr. Lu, uh, uh, he was a student in the lab. He can, she came to me and showed me a great data one time. They say, see this uh, red and the blue light, blue uh, curve, perfect uh, reaction curve uh, started be even before uh, in about eight minutes. And more than that is, the reproducibility is very good. You can he repeat it five times, you three to five times, and every time get this kind of curve. So I was shocked to see that. Sounds like uh, uh, she has a magic hand. So, but that's not the case. So when I check with her uh, detailed design, I figure out she made a mistake that um, design this four and five CRNA for targeting uh, not the call we call corn. Uh, canonic, canonic 
pen, which is TTTV, can make a mistake to target the TNTV. So by the one, you could ask it a mistake. But this mistake actually targeting, make it targeting a suboptimal pen, which is not the best pen, but can be, still can be cleavage. This suboptimal pen design sounds like have a great benefit for one port detection using uh, CRISPR Cas12a. So we repeat this phenomenon in different genes. This also for uh, of cas uh, SARS cov 2 also identify the same phenomenon. Then we got did a more careful a more careful investigation. We first figure out this this uh, suboptimal pen design can re actually reduce this. It's called uh, trans cleavage, right? So basically. Essentially, if we do not have any combination with one port reaction, it's reduce the fluorescent signal. But when you combine with this uh, one, one port reaction, which always combine with uh, uh, the RPA uh, of isosomal amplification, it's really greatly improve the performance of this called one port physical detection. This then we put all kind of um, because you can think about the you may have only three different uh, chaotic PAM for a specific sequence, right? So it's called TTTA, TTTG, or TTTC, which means com in combined with TTTV. But you can have so many of the suboptimal PAM because you can mutate any of the T to a different, different, um, different nucleotide other than T. So we tested all these different combinations for two different cRNA sequences and identified Many of our uh, large part of the suboptimal PAM can accelerate this so-called one-part reaction. That is sounds like a universal uh, approach to improve the reaction. Not only can improve the reaction speed, but also can improve the reaction uh, sensitivity. The so sensitivity is at least thirty-fold increase, and more importantly, the reliability of car, which which can be repeated or not in between each time. So we do about 20 to 30 times for this one experiment. You can see the red dots is the producibility of the suboptimal PAM and the, 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 the black one is the chaotic PAM or the chaotic design. It's not reliable, but suboptimal PAM is so tight for the each uh, fluorescence values. So it increases in many ways of this so-called one part reaction. But although we figure out the phenomenon, but we do not know why it improves. So why you have reduced uh, trans cleavage or we call collateral uh, activity, it, it's enhanced the total performance of CRISPR detection. So why it happened? So we figure out that actually the isosomal amplification and CRISPR cis cleavage are competing with each other in the one part reaction, right? So think about this, uh, it's quite clear in this case. Uh, when you have RPA only, it's amplification is very fast, it can good amplicon, but you will have a chaotic PAM and the cost, which has cost to recognize in the amplicon. So it's rapidly degraded replicon and uh, really strongly interfere with the RPA process. So when you have a suboptimal PAM, this interference is, is much reduced or even diminished sometimes, I would say that. So this can Strongly promote the amplification of the of the original, you know, oxalic acids, and eventually promote the entire reaction uh, kinetics. So basically, turning the cis cleavage efficiency while suboptimal PAM, you can enhance this, this one part reaction um, one part reaction process. So, but is that all? Suboptimal PAM working this way sounds like may not because according to our um, previous uh, figures, it's not the case. So, and which one can work well, which one will not? So we do a comprehensive analysis of a cis cleavage. We figure out that actually, if you have too high cis cleavage, which is if you're turning the pen, suboptimal PAM, but the cis cleavage is still as good as the PAM, it will not work. If you have too low cis cleavage, so man related to have very low uh, trans cleavage, it will not work very well as well. So you have kind of an intermediate this cleavage, which is have a you know number here, and it can 
significantly improve the one per reaction. So more than this, uh, you know, performance uh, value, actually sub omnipam has another advantage of relax the selection criteria. So although for the SARS-CoV-2, you have 1,000, more than 1,000 potential choices uh, for chronic PAM PDTV, and but you have much more for sub PAM, about five to seven folds more. And, and uh, if you really want to uh, re develop a det 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 detection kit, that means you have to select a very conserved sequence and very important, you know, important genes. Like that will dramatically reduce the available PAM selection. But in this case, the optimum PAM has the advantage of provide many folds, I think mean, five to seven folds more choices for uh, for CRNA design. So this will be relax the you know conditions to make a commercial available kit. So basically, uh, what we're talking about about this uh, this methodology we give a name called Spank, which means the optimum PAM for CRISPR detection. This Spank can in increase the speed. Um, reliability and the sensitivity of the assay and also relax the session of the CRNA. And then we'll use Spank first to detect a DNA virus called human CMV. And this sensitivity is the same as qPCR and speed of Spank is about 8 to 15 minutes to detect a DNA virus. More than that, we also compare Spank with uh, Stop COVID developed by Fan Zan in 2020 in the New England Journal paper. So compared with a stop COVID, Spank is about three folds faster, which requires 15 to 20 minutes compared with 15 minutes. And the detection limit is about 30 something folds to 54 higher than stop COVID uh, in terms of to detect out of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Then we use Spank to detect the real sample, the patient samples, um, which containing the SARS-CoV-2, and we figure out the sensitivity is about ninety-four percent, and specificity is hundred percent, and then all the assay can get results in about twenty minutes. So, make a summary here for Spank is that we develop a one-part detection methodology we call Spank, Spank to enhance not only the speed, sensitivity, and and the flexibility of design, as well as to produce ability of one per reaction. And second, we dissect the mechanism how spank work so to improve the performance when meantime it reduce the trans cleavage of cocktail A. And then we use spank to detect a DNA and a RNA virus for proof of concept. So I mean the immediate last next question is can this spank um principle a uh, principle be adapted for other cast proteins such as cas 12 b because cas 12 b can work really well in higher than usual temperature, like for them 60 degrees. That allows you to combine with uh, isosomal uh, amplification called LAMP. So because LAMP you only use one enzyme to uh, finish the uh, work. So it's very popular in clinics uh, for detecting uh, a virus. So interesting when we do a uh, Suboptimal PAM strategy for class 12B not only it not do not work at all. So not only for the you know so RPA for also for lamp in both methodology of isosomal amplification is do not work. So we figure out why that we speculate why actually we speculate why because the chaotic PAM for class 12B is very simple. It only have three nucleotides, but this last one is the N which we do not count. So it's only a TT. This two nucleotide, if you just turning one of them, it may severely reduce the cleavage the, or activity of cas 12 b making it will not work. So in this case, we thinking uh, we are we were thinking of alternative strategy that maybe we do not do not use a suboptimum PAM, but we engineering the PAM reacting domain in the cas 12 b protein. So we Carefully look at the structure of cas 12 b and engineered a uh, reacted amino acid one by one, which to the interacting to the PAM sequence. You can see one of the particular mutations dramatically increase the signal 
intensity uh, when it's combined with a lamp um, lamp um, for one power detection, suggesting this is a good mutation. Then we do a second round of mutation uh, screen. We come for two double mutations. So based on this particular G four seven eight eight A mutation, we also combine with different other mutations, and also this screen of mutation further improve the the performance of the mutants in the one part detection methodology. So when we compare with the double mutants, or we call part twelve B two M. Its performance is much better than the white type control. Its speed is two or three times faster and have much higher signal um, experience here. And when we do the sensitivity comparisons, actually, it really depends on different CRNA. This sensitivity all improved as a range from a 10 to 10,000 fold improvement. So it really depends on CRNA itself. But overall, it's improved a lot. And uh, I think the mechanism. To be similar to the you know previous uh, revealed in the cast twelve A cases, so it reduces cleavage of the lamp as well as enhance the amplification of lamp. Eventually, improve the entire performance. So I think the good part of the the part, this the technology is is simpler than the RPF. Your lamp is simpler. And RPF make the entire process simpler. Then we use this technology to compare with. Uh, white type cas 12 b with lamp combination, which actually this white type cas 12 b and lamp combination is exactly as the stop COVID described in, in Zenfen's paper. So this combination actually um, showed almost 100% cases of detection rate to detect all of the 85 samples of cas uh, sars cov 2 patients. And in the contrast, Stop COVID about seventy seven percent sensitivity, which is also very consistent with uh, Fan Zhang's description in his in his paper. And uh, you can imagine that to protein engineering is a universal approach, right? So if we do the for the, we go back to do a cas twelve A engineering, you may have the same results as um, PEM PEM suboptimal PEM. So we to prove off in our theory is correct. We also Engineer the PEM inhibition domain of cas 12 a to identify one of the mutations and dramatically improve this uh, one-part reaction. And this performance is similar to the suboptimal PEM. Also, this you know this mutant also further expand the capability of the targeting sequences by uh, cas 12 a one-part detection. So, basically, in summary, here we engineer we. Suboptimal PEM is not universal. It's only working on for maybe only for cast factors with complicated PEM, but for a cast 12 B, which with simple PEM would not work, and for a effect like cast 13 A, do not have any PEM requirement, will not work, work as well. And the structure guided engineering, I think, is is adaptable approach to enhance CRISPR detections across different effectors. And uh, the combination of cas 12 B and mutants and LAMP really have a good potential for translation. Uh, for a reason that LAMP has been already been adopted in clinical settings, the, the downside of cas LAMP alone is, is uh, for supportive. And if you have cas 12 B adding here, it may eliminate chance of for the positive to improve sense specificity and have a chance also, I mean, have a chance also to enhance the sensitivity of entire pro a process because uh, the design of the primers can be uh, more flexible. And a last part of my talk, I will share with you uh, um, another engineering process we did for actually class 13 a But this interesting part we learned from our translation process, you know, we, when we do the translation back to about uh, one and a half years ago, our the you know the basically the biotech. Uh, Company we collaborate with really thinking about the cost of entire process, which is the key for translation. And he mentioned they mentioned that actually engineers in the in the in the in the company mentioned that this technology is nice, but really downside of that is you cannot compete with engine tests. Engine test is so cheap, it's so convenient, so simple. Although it has a low sensitivity, but every other advantage is good enough to to make it very popular. Actually. 
possibly the most popular test is the engine test uh, worldwide. So that also also making the isothermal amplification also which which is one five hundred more sensitized sensitive than the engine test not less popular because it require a small machine which is to do a uh, temperature control. So they are they raise a uh, question to us: uh, Can you make this a uh, room temperature without the temperature control? So we think about this and think about maybe it's possible. Uh, we can try it. So we try it. We not do not but not use class twelve A and B because we uh, but because the trans cleavage is activity is not the best in, across different effectors. The best. One of the best, at least one of the best effects is cut 12, cut 13 A. Its trans activity is at least tenfold higher than A and B of cut 12 A. So we pick up cut 12 A and look at the one part reaction which been developed in the literature called Shine. Shine is a great design that is really combined you know, this complicated process in one tube. I will figure out, uh, we will look at carefully one downside of the design is that cut 13 cut these original sequences when also meanwhile cut the amplified you know RNA from the entire process. The reason that if cut 13 do not cut original sequence to let the entire process go more smoothly, it may improve the performance. So indeed we redesign the entire process. So end of the day we can make the CRNA of cas 13 a targeting the reverse complementary sequences of the antigen, of the nucleic acids uh, from the pathogen. So in this case, the entire process go much more smoothly. And we see an intense signal, accelerate speed, as well as up to 1,000-fold improved uh, sensitivity in this redesigned process we call reverse. And we further optimize reverse so simply by you know, adjust the doses of each component and test it in different temperature conditions. And the really good part of it is in 20, at 20 degree, the, re, 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 the optimized version of reverse or reverse two can detect very low amount of nuclear acids uh, in within 30 minutes. So this really uh, makes us very exciting about how it further to detect the samples in clinical setting. So we use uh, SARS-CoV-2 patient samples and allow the reverse two to react at room temperature for 30 minutes. It detects most of samples, only missed one sample here. And the uh, really good part of this is the detection limit is as good as the best in class qPCR. And, uh, and uh, you know, this is without a temperature control. And our process seems to be simple because you only require a blue light to detect the signal here. So let me make a summary at last. I'd like to really uh, share with you today is to we develop a suboptimal pen based cas 12 a detection for uh, for you know for detection of nuclear acids, and we also engineered uh, the cas 12 b and as well as A, uh, in particular focusing on the PI domain to improve the performance. We also developed a uh, cas 13 based room temperature detection by redesign the process of cas 13 a based one part reaction. So the entire process is to reduce the interference with amplification to improve the speed, sensitivity, and signal intensity. And uh, at last, I really want to uh, thank uh, a lot of you know, students, uh, particularly working very hard in the project, uh, Dr. Uh, now Dr. Hong. Uh, she now is a postdoc in the lab, and uh, Dr. Lu now is she is uh, a faculty at another university in China, and uh, and uh, a student, and and then and other collaborators here, and I thank um my collaborators from um Wuhan uh, Bio Institute, Institute of Biology, as well as from the hospitals and uh, um a few colleagues from uh, uh from a different institute to help with. The collaborate with the, the ASFV uh, detection, which we really making us to enter the field of uh, molecular diagnosis. A lot of thank for all the funding here, and thank you for all for attention. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you. How it has really, really beautiful work. I so amazing. You know, share three of these outstanding works. How hard you know work you are because we know Wuhan has stopped for you know almost one year or two years. So you still did so many works. So congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, now we yeah. Yeah, uh, we save the questions until the last part of our panel. Okay. Yeah. Now let me introduce our second speaker, Gina. Yeah. Uh, so Gina. Yeah. Uh, okay. When you prepare your slides, let me uh, give a brief introduction to Gina. Gina was an assistant professor at the UPenn. Uh, so Gina was uh, got a bachelor degree from Rice University. Amazing was not only in a bio study, also he studied a language, French. So I suggest you today speak English, not French. Okay. Yeah, because French <laughs> we couldn't catch up with you. And uh, then he got a PhD at UPenn, but during that time she already pioneers in AI because she developed this machine learning based, you know, biomarks detection. So uh, it's very amazing work at that time. And then Gina go to uh, the Massachusetts uh, hospital, right? Yeah, so I did a postdoc there and now she back to UPenn as assistant professor. Gina has a lot of things to share with us for her advanced, you know, uh, molecular dynamics. Gina, please, stage yours. Share screen. Awesome. Thank you so much for the great introduction. Um, yeah, thanks so much for the invitation. I'm very excited to share my work with you all today. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about single biomarker profiling for different medical diagnostics. So what our lab does is we are trying to develop next generation tools for medical diagnostics. We are thinking about what are the tools that are missing right now that can be developed to measure some biomarkers that are really hard to be measured um, due to many different reasons. And in order to develop those technologies, we are trying to combine bioengineering, molecular bio, and chemistry tools to solve different clinical problems. So there are many different technologies that we've developed so far, and there are three different features that we try to achieve in order for the tech development. The first feature is high throughput because we're very interested in running the sample volume with high throughput so that we can identify the rare biomarkers in the fluid, such as plasma, um, serum, or other biofluids. And also we want to achieve ultra high sensitivity because all the biomarkers will going to be pretty rare and really hard to find and also apply multiplexing either by machine learning or other statistical um, learning algorithms so that we can combine different markers to find a signature which can be more robustly applied to many different patients. So for today's talk, I'll talk a little bit about the single EV work that um, I did during my postdoc. Um, and also we have some follow-up projects that we're doing here at Penn. Um, so that will be the first story. So EVs are extracellular vesicles that are shed from their mother cells. So these tiny little microvesicles and exosomes that you can see that are shedded by the cells, those are all called as EVs. And what's really great about EVs is that they have the molecular cargo of their mother cells. So if the cells are really in a hard to access area, such as brain cells or pancreatic cancer cells, we can identify the signature using EVs coming from their mother cells because these EVs are circulating in the bloodstream and they're also found in many different biofluids, including saliva, urine, and all the other ones. So these are really great biomarker, but the problem is they're really small. The diameter is only a few hundred nanometer in size. And there's a huge background because even though you're interested in one specific disease, all the healthy cells secret their own EVs too. And they're very heterogeneous because they're all coming from different cells of origin and their functions are highly different from each other. So our goal is to 
develop a technology that can really use this heterogeneous EV as a diagnostic tool. And one thing that we have to achieve is trying to profile individual EV. So the approach here is pretty similar to what people have done for single cell RNA sequencing in order to find the rare cell populations that we didn't know before, we can identify them individually. And we wanted to apply the same concept to EVs as well. So we first developed droplet digital PCR for single EV profiling and then scaled that up to sequencing so that we can profile more EV and also more markers at the same time um, by implementing sequencing as the final readout. So here is the um, pipeline for single EV protein sequencing, where we first start with EV, and then we label the EV with antibody DNA. Antibody, we're going to target the proteins of interest from the EV, and then the DNA can be used as a barcode so that we can target many different proteins, but also we can use it as amplification. After that, we encapsulate those EVs along with barcoded bits into a droplet, and then we perform sequencing. So the actual pipeline is not that different from what people are doing for single cell analysis, but then we spend a lot of time optimizing the last part, sequencing um, pipeline, because when you think about EVs, especially individual EVs, they're a few hundred nanometer in diameter, which means that the content that they have compared to the cells, which are usually 10 micron, 20 micron, by volume, it'll be a million times less than what we have from single cells. So we had to develop our own sequencing protocol that can be ultra high sensitive so that we can pick up the contents coming from individual EV. So the first step is doing extension in droplets. So within the droplets, we have barcoded bead that will gonna tell us EV barcode, meaning that which EV the molecule is coming from, and then UMI unique molecular identifier so that we can quantify the number of molecules. And then we have the sequence that we're going to be complementary to the antibody DNA sequence. Um, the antibody DNA sequence has antibody barcodes so that we can identify which proteins that we are targeting, and then the T7 promoter sequence so that we can perform in vitro transcription. So once they hybridize, they're going to extend and we'll be able to make one amplicon that we are interested in that have all the information. And then we proceed with IVT in vitro transcription so that we can do another amplification by converting DNA to RNA, making thousands of copies of RNA from single DNA molecule. But also what's good about IVT is that we can get rid of all the DNA fragments that are not fully amplified, which can be considered as a background signal in the later stage. So we use DNAs to get rid of those DNA fragments. Only the amplicon that was successfully extended were able to be converted to RNA. And then we do RT and PCR for another amplification and then do sequencing. So we first check the amplicon and also the sequences, and then we compare that to bulk EV analysis, and then the single EV and no EV as a control, and we were able to achieve the size of the amplicon that we were expecting. And also when we did Sanger sequencing, we were able to get the sequence that we were expecting as well. So as a proof of concept, we profiled raw 264 macrophage cell line for the EV profiling. So individual row here is that individual EV, and then each column represents different protein expression from those EV. And using that information, we can identify different subpopulations of the EV, such as double positive, triple positive populations that cannot be profiled when we are measuring in bulk. So right now we are trying to um, further develop this technology because one challenge that we faced here was 
even though we develop really sensitive technology for EV, we cannot really change the biology of EV having really small number of molecules per EV. So we actually developed our own concept, new concept called double digital assay, where we not only looking at what we not only look at individual EV, but then from single EV population, we want to count individual molecules expressed from single EV so that we can achieve ultra high sensitive measurements. And this work was led by one of my PhD students, David Reynolds. So we first performed double compartmentalization. So we created our own micro wells and within the micro well, we coded a mono layer of microbead. And then each microbead will going to capture one single molecule from the EV so that we can achieve digital assay. So you can see the beads that are laid on the micro well, and then we add the EV using the Poisson's ratio. We can target one EV per micro well. And after that, we seal the wells using an oil. And then within the micro well, EV is sterilized and then proteins are captured on the micro bead. And because we are looking at individual molecules, we need a sort of amplification so that we can visualize individual molecules. So for that, purpose, we're using TSA, tyramid signal amplification. So we first validated that TSA is really important and necessary for single EV analysis, where you can see um, from the cells when we apply TSA, we were able to get um, highly boosted signal compared to no TSA and control. And then for EV as well, we were able to get really good amplification using TSA compared to no TSA and control as well. So here we first performed that we can load single particles um, because eventually we want to load individual EV into the micro well. We first tested our calculation using single cells because they're a lot bigger. We can visualize them really well. And we showed that um, with 10,000 cells loaded into the device, we were able to achieve 10% of the cells in well, which can be the Poisson distribution of having individual cell loading per micro well. And we also checked that we can load individual EV inside individual micro wells as well. Um, we first stained the EV with calcium green um, so that we can visualize them under fluorescent microscopy. And then uh, we imaged them using the micro well and we were able to find the EV that are inside the micro well. And then for the next experiment, we profiled um, PDL1 expression coming from bulk and single EV. So for bulk EV, all the EVs are inside a tube. Um, we use two different melanoma cell lines. One is PDL1 knockout cell line, and then the other one is PDL1 positive. And we are able to show the um, high specificity of the PDL1. And also the same was achieved for single EV as well. So for the final experiment, we were able to profile individual EV PDL1 molecule expression. So um, as a control experiment, we performed ELISA on the PDL1 positive and negative cell lines, and we were able to get an average PDL1 molecule expression per EV. Because ELISA is working with bulk EV, we can only get average expression rather than the expression coming from individual EV. And then we also um, compare that to our own chip, um, looking at single EV analysis. And there also, when you compare the average, we're able to get around three PDL1 molecules per EV, which corresponded well to the number that we saw from the bulk EV analysis as well. So this graph is to compare the LOD limit of detection coming from the ELISA, which is this blue line, and then our chip, which is the red line, and we were able to achieve 60, 60 times better LOD than the conventional ELISA. And then the bottom right graph really shows that for um, more like a histogram, the distribution of the PDL1 expression from different EVs. 
So that was the story of using EVs as a biomarker and how we can develop a technology that can profile individual molecules and also individual EVs that can be used for different diagnostics. And then the second story that I want to tell you is more on using single cell profiling for a different diagnostic approach. So here, what we are trying to do is to monitor time, which is tumor immune microenvironment, because immunotherapy has been really successful in a subset of patients who are previously incurable, but then they're non-responders, so we do not really know why they are not really responding. And then time has been found to have an important role in determining the therapeutic efficacy. So our hypothesis was that if we develop a technology that can monitor the time during the course of the treatment, using that information, we might be able to um, change the therapeutic options for different patients so that we can improve the patient outcomes. And then in order to monitor the time, we are interested in using fine needle aspiration because there's a tiny little needle that can um, go into the cancer tumor area so that we can actually get the immune cells and cancer cells out that reside with the tumor, um, but it's also considered as minimally invasive way to get the biomarkers out because the needle is very, very small. But then the problem of FNA samples is that they're very scant, meaning that we only get a few thousand cells out per needle pass. Um, whereas if you want to use fluid cytometry to look at single cells, look at all different immune cell types, the scale doesn't really match because you only get a few thousand cells out. But then for flow, we need at least a few hundred thousand cells to do all those immune profiling. So there are many current cycling methods that people have developed in order to solve this issue, which means that you are staining the cells with a certain number of markers, and then you remove the signal so that you can stain again with the same sample and go over again and again for multiplexing with the same number of cells. But then the problem of the current methods include using very harsh chemicals such as hydrogen peroxide or NaOH in order to strip off the fluorophore. And also that process takes more than 30 minutes. And because they're using harsh chemicals, it works very well with the FFPE tissue samples, but not necessarily with the single cell FNA samples. So our goal was to develop a gentle ultrafast method for a single cell profiling. Basically, what we wanted to achieve is to stain the cells with a certain marker and remove the signal and repeat this with other marker, other color for the fluorescent microscopy and quench the signal and repeat it over and over. But then we wanted to be really ambitious and try to make the quenching time to be pretty similar to what I showed you here. Just a few seconds of quenching, all the signals gone. And we were brainstorming different ideas and thinking about like what can we use to achieve this extremely fast kinetics. And then one idea was using the TCOTC click chemistry pair, uh, which can be made as a conjugate. And based on what kind of TCOTC you're using, we can achieve this within a minute or so. So what we did here was that we labeled TCO with fluorophore and antibodies so that the antibody can target the protein. Fluorophore can be used for imaging and the TCO can click to this TZ, which is conjugated to BHQ3, which is black hole quencher, which means that when the click happens, TCO and TZ, this quencher can be in proximity or in contact with the fluorophore here so that it can achieve instantaneous quenching. And fortunately, we were able to achieve even faster quenching that, than what we were expecting. So here in the first row, you can see all the beautifully stained cells. And then for the second row, we quenched the signal using different time points. 
Um, so we incubated for five minutes, one minute, 30 seconds, and 10 seconds. And as you can see, um, even 10 seconds was more than enough to remove all the signal. So we were very excited about the results. And then using the technology, we were able to profile MC38, colon cancer tumor, um, FNA samples, and look at the immune cell profiling there. Normally, if you use conventional fluorescent microscopy, you will going to look at around four different markers and you cannot do more than that. But then for our case, because we can do cycling, we did four different cycles, looked at 16 different markers and using those markers, we're able to identify the intratumoral immune composition. Um, so the idea here is that we can take FNA samples during the course of treatment, get the composition. Once the treatment is done, we can identify the patients, um, non-responders and responders, and retrospectively, we can identify what kind of signatures are causing um, high response or low response. Um, another great feature of our technology was their very gentle chemical probes. So we were interested in applying these to live cells because there was no other technology working with live cells. It was all with fixed cells. So we have live cells here. We stain them and then quench them and they were working very well. So we moved on and then tried to work with all the live cells. So here, what we did was we isolated PBMC, peripheral blood mononuclear cells from a mouse, and then we divided the cells into two, one for flow cytometry, and then the other one for our method. And we were able to profile 14 different immune markers and then show that those two technologies are highly positively correlated to each other. But what our technology can offer that the flow cannot offer is that we can keep track of the same cells over time because we're actually imaging them rather than for flow, you just um, you just feed the cells through the machine. So as another um, proof of concept, we were able to profile live bone marrow cells from a mouse. Here also, we did four different cycles, three different color imaging per cycle. So we were able to identify 12 different markers and using different combinations, we were able to identify different myeloid subsets. So this is really to show that we can do high multiplexing and do that kind of profiling, not only in fixed cells, but also in live cells. So also we were able to show that we can perform this um, ex vivo to live tissue as well. So we pre-stain the freshly harvested liver tissue from a mouse. And then in real time, we were able to stain the cells, the tissue with our chemical probe. And then we were able to show that we can remove the signal within a minute or two um, using our TZ BHQ quencher. And as one application showing that why we need this technology, what can we do with this technology that cannot be done? Um, we wanted to show one application, which is neutrophil differentiation. So here we chose HOXBA neutrophils as a differentiation model. So what happens is that you first start with immortalized progenitor cells. And when you remove the beta estradiol, which is a hormone, um, the cells will going to differentiate and then and they will go um, become mature neutrophils. So we first designed microwells to monitor the same cells over time. And then we perform those cyclic imaging every two days from the same cells and then monitor them over time. So the first row is CD45, which is a positive immune cell marker that will be expressed by all different immune cells. You can see that we first started with seven cells. They proliferated. You can see more cells and then confluent cells. And the CKIT, the second row, um, CKIT is a marker for progenitor cells. So what happens here is that Day zero, when we remove the beta estradiol, the hormone, that's when the cells start to differentiate. That's why you lose the signal after day zero. And then CD11B, LY6C, LY6G, those are the markers for 
neutrophils. So as the cells differentiate into neutrophils, you see more and more of those expressions. And F480 was used for negative control. Um, so here the goal was to compare our technology to flow cytometry and make sure the perturbations that we are um, applying to the cells due to the chemical probe treatment doesn't really change any biology and all the cells are healthy. They differentiate into neutrophils as expected. And then in addition to that, what our technology can provide is keeping track of the same cells over time um, which we cannot do using other technologies. And then we applied this to in vivo as well. So we did multiplexing in vivo, identifying um, 12 different markers from the window chamber mice in order to monitor the drug delivery. And then moving on, another project that we were very excited about was organoid monitoring. We have a collaborator um, who can make brain-drive, um, patient-drive brain organoids. And what he was interested in is using those organoids to find the best treatment options for each patient. But then he mentioned that the problem is that brain organoids are very complex. There are going to be many different brain cell types. And in addition to that, uh, because he is applying immunotherapy, we also have to monitor immune cells as well and how those two different cell types are interacting to each other. And we were thinking our technology can be the best fit here because we can monitor live cells with high multiplexing. So we can target brain cell types, but also immune cell types at the same time. So we first wanted to know if we can even stain or quench the organoids because organoids are slightly different from in vitro cell culture, ex vivo, and also in vivo. And then that worked really well. And also we applied that to live organoids too, and then that worked really well as well. So we first showed that we can stain fixed um, patient-derived brain organoids using our chemical probe, and then we can also quench them with our probe, where you can see that the quenching time takes a little longer than what we showed before, but still within a minute or so, all the signals gone. And also we applied that to live cells, and then showed that we can beautifully stain the live cells, and then we can quench the signal over time as well. So for this study, we were able to show that we can do multiplex imaging in fixed organoids where we did three different cycles, three different marker imaging. So looked at nine different marker profiling. And then we also looked at live organoids. So here we looked at three different markers, two different cycles, and looked at the heterogeneity of the um brain organoids coming from different patients. And also after we were done with the cyclic imaging, we made sure to observe the cell health, health over time to make sure the cells are still healthy and they proliferate. So we measure them until 72 hours and we were able to see good proliferation of different healthy cells. So um, as a conclusion, um, there are two different areas that we've been working on recently. One is more on the single EV detection to use EVs as a biomarker for different diagnostics. And then the other part was multiplex live cell imaging, where we first designed a probe in order to do multiplexing on single cells, FNA samples. And then eventually we applied that to live cells, live tissue, and also live organoids as well. So with that, I want to thank all our collaborators or our funding source, and most importantly, really thank all our LEM members for making the best environment for the research and science. Thank you. Hi, dear Gina. How nice the talk it is. Yeah, so proud of you. Uh, so we'll save the yeah. question to the panel discussions. Now uh, let's go to the third speakers. Also, the organizer of this session is Jin Zhao Song. Uh, actually, uh, Professor Song now is working at Hangzhou Institute of uh, Medicine uh, in the Chinese Academy of Science. 
And he graduated from uh, Institute of Chemistry, Chinese Academy of Science, that many years ago, should be 50 years ago, more than that, and then traveled to US and they became a, a research assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, it won a lot of awards, published many these prestigious in uh, the publications. Uh, more importantly, Professor Sun has uh, uh, you know, special talent for the entrepreneurship. He set up uh, his own company, you know, for to commercialize or uh, transfer, you know, his technology to the real market. So, uh, Professor Sun host uh, uh, use talks last year was in Chinese. Now this year, we're going to hear the story in English. Doctor Sun, please. Uh, all right, all right. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Zhang. Uh, thank you for the introduction. As time today uh, is limited, we will proceed directly to the main topic. Today, our focus is the next generation molecular diagnostics. Undoubtedly, a programmable endonuclease such as uh, CRISPR Cas and Argonaut is playing a significant role in advancing uh, this field. Additionally, liquid biopsy technologies are crucial as well. Gina just uh, emphasized this uh, with her EV studies. Uh, next, I will discuss the pivotal role that smartphones will play in this area. And additionally, I will introduce another liquid biopsy technology uh, that developed in our lab. These are some pictures about UPEN. I have been working at Penn, uh, Penn Engineering for seven and a half years, as Dr. Zhang just introduced, uh, from a postdoc to a research assistant professor. That is the reason uh, I know Gina. After resigning from UPenn, uh, I joined the Chinese Academy of Sciences and founded a company called EZDX Technology. In addition to uh, liquid biopsy methods, EZDX is mainly focusing on at-home and on-site testing methods and devices. Most of our devices are developed for isosomal amplification uh, and fluorescence detection. Compared to uh, co colorimetric detection, such as the uh, pH change-based colorimetric detection, our experience uh, has shown that fluorescent detection is more specific, sens sensitive, and more flexible for IC design. Uh, previously, we developed uh, several fluorescence uh, uh, detection uh, devices. However, as you know, uh, fluorescence detection typically requires uh, excitation lessons and the filters, making the, the detection system more costly and uh, complex. On the other hand, Luminescence is much simpler. Uh, it doesn't require excitation lessons and the filters, but it is not compatible with probe-based detection, uh, such as CRISPR uh, IC and uh, Argo-based IC. To pursue uh, low cost and uh, high performance, we conducted deep research over the past three years. Finally, we achieved success. Uh, currently, our device can be priced at uh, $1,000 or even below that. The cost per single test uh, can be maintained under $5. Our first mass produced device is VD1. These are uh, some VD1 features. It weighs only 208 grams. It can interface with smart smartphone in real time. Its adaptive consumables is just uh, uh, it's only two hundred microliter PCR tube. Importantly, uh, it uh, it's compatible with all isosomal almost all isosomal methods such as RPA lamp, uh, CRISPR based uh, uh, methods, and Argonaut based methods. Uh, more importantly, it has two fluorescent channels. This is a duplex uh, 
visualization method we developed with PF Argo, as you can see, when ASF virus present, the color is green. When PRRSV virus present, the color is red. Uh, when the two viruses coexist, the color is yellow. The negative, it is dark. The core technology of this method uh, include controlled release of Leoflas PF Argo. The related work uh, ju has just uh, published in two papers, uh, one on biosensors and the bioelectronics, another uh, published on uh, sensors and actuator B. Uh, this work we collaborated with uh, Jiao Hong Bao. Uh, they are also a startup. During the pandemic, we have been offering SARS CoV 2 uh, rapid test voluntarily with VD1. Uh, let's take a look at uh, this video. Uh, Jin Zhao, this one, no sound. Oh. Also, uh, recently, it gained popularity for GMO products uh, detection. Our second mass produced device is a uh, VD Mini. It weighs only 61 gram. It enables uh, real time quantitative analysis via smartphone interface. Uh, it can uh, make automated result inter interpretation. Importantly, it's 5 watts powered. That means you can directly use smartphone charger or smartphone batteries. The core technology uh, incorporated in this device include our self-developed uh, proprietary high, highly sensitive optical sensing system and the ultra-compact industrial design. For these advancements, we have the independent uh, intellectual property rights. Uh, let's take a look at the video. Uh, this video this video shows the good performance of, of our developed one tube one step lamp crispr IC when using VD mini the amplification curve generated is totally comparable to that produced by traditional PCR the core innovation of this IC uh, is uh, we addressed the efficient compatibility issue between nucleic acid uh, isosomal amplification and the CRISPR-specific cleavage. Uh, 
Uh, Dr. Yin uh, tackled this issue by reducing the interference of tag target amplification that we have improved it in another aspect. Uh, we are currently in, in the process of preparing a manuscript on this topic. This is our third uh, mass producer device, VD1 Pro. It developed based on VD1, but it enables real-time quantitative analysis. It can be connected to his and the list system. Importantly, it is capable of independent operation. The indicator displays temperature and the progress. Uh, it is capable of semi-quantitative analysis. Also, it eliminates the need for subjective judgment. Uh, it is important for FDA, CE, uh, NMPA uh, registration in the future. This video shows a uh, lamp CRISPR one tube one step IC uh, performed on VD1 Pro platform. Five copies of reaction Per reaction can be easily detected. Uh, this is the enhanced one port lamp PF Argo IC. Uh, this video shows that the platform offers pr precise temperature control even at 95 degrees Celsius. Recently, we added amplification uh, curve endpoint retracing functionality to the, to the devices. It allows we varying of amplification curves at the any time when after reaction com com completion. Uh, as long as connect the smartphone to our cloud or our device. Also, we developed a easy DX cloud. It can manage users' testing results, health information, and send guidance for users' healthcare. Uh, currently, in addition to industrial and CN users, we also have many research users from well-known institutions, including research users from uh, UPenn, uh, from John Hopkins University, from Wuhaning University, from Lancaster University, uh, Leiden University, and uh, NEB, uh, NEB RMD de uh, department. Uh, we even have research users in the Middle East, especially from the University of uh, Sharjah, uh, which is located in close proximity to Dubai. These are our social media QRD uh, bar barcode. You can scan the barcode to follow us to get more information about our products. Or you can also search EZTX technology to follow us. Uh, we have YouTube channel, LinkedIn, uh, WeChat channel, uh, WeChat official account, and TikTok. Uh, okay, uh, another critical aspect of next generation molecular diagnostics, in my opinion, is the utilization of liquid biopsy. Gina introduced uh, uh, their you know, inventions on uh, EVA targeted isolation and the biomarker ident identification. In my opinion, in terms of liquid biopsy, ctDNA detection will also play a significant role because, because of its non invasiveness, ease of monitoring, uh, and early detection. By the way, uh, I want to cl clarify that when I mentioned ctDNA, it also covers uh, exosome or EV nucleic acids. Since we do not isolate the uh, EV when we purify cell-free DNA from plasma. Uh, but for ctDNA detection, there are big challenges. First of all, mutant leaves from tumor cells exhibit only one or few nucleotide differences compared to cell-free wild-type nucleic acids. Secondly, the presence of large amounts of cell-free wild-type nucleic acids in body fluids may in, inter, 
inter interfere with the detection of rare mutant leads. So cDNA detection is often referred to as looking for a needle in a haystack. Well, at Penn, I began to pay attention on Argonaut. Fortunately, I discovered that TTAGO and PFAGO possesses the remarkable ability to discriminate single bit pair mismatch under certain uh, conditions. Based on this finding, we established uh, a rare mutant allele enrichment method with doublet navigator. Navigator significantly improves the sensitivity of downstream rare mutant allele detection. Uh, for example, 1% of mutant alleles cannot be detected by Sanger sequencing alone, but it can be easily detected uh, after navigator treatment. Combined navigator uh, with Sanger sequencing, we can detect mutant alleles at levels as low as 0.1%. Uh, However, this level of sensitivity is still insufficient for tumor minimum residue uh, uh, MRD detection. It usually requires 0.01% of detection limit. To achieve this sensitivity, we first developed uh, PASI. Programmable endonuclease assisted selective exponential amplification. The basic idea of PASI is using a programmable endonuclease to selectively cleave vector alleles uh, while exponentially amplifying mutant alleles. To make the mutant allele dominate in the system and make its ratio infinitely approaches 100%. As you can see, after passive enrichment, 1.01% of mutant allele can be easily recognized even by, by, even by uh, low-cost Sanger sequencing. What is the clinical performance of this technology? Clinical testing shows that the detection rate of cDNA of uh, advanced pancreatic cancer patients can reach up to 95% prior to uh, chemotherapy. The de detection rate of uh, we found that the detection rate of pancreatic cancer cDNA is closely related to metastatic sites, therapeutic efficacy, and the treatment status. In patients who have already undergone uh, chemotherapy, we observed a significant decrease in uh, the detection rate. Uh, which is only around 45%. Upon further analysis of their medical records, we found that most of the undetected patients had a achieved a partial response, indicating that the treatment was effective. This result suggests that this te technology can be used for monitoring the uh, therapeutic efficacy. Certainly, this technology can also be utilized for companion diagnostics to get the uh, target, targeted therapy, such as the Kira's G12C targeted therapy. For efficacy monitoring, we are following up with 55 patients. Uh, CTDNA exhibits much better timeline and accuracy compared to tumor markers such as CA99. In terms of MRD detection, we are currently following up with 22 pancreatic cancer patients. Uh, for the four patients who have experienced a relapse, we successfully predicted their relapse and the metastasis in advance uh, about two or five months earlier. And, and the rec recommended targeted therapies accordingly. Lastly, with this slide, let me thank my team members. With this slide, let me thank my collaborators, including the collaborators uh, at, Penn, at uh, uh, Penn Engineering and the other institutes. Especially, let me thank Professor Hin Bao. Uh, he, he is my mentor when I work at Penn. 
and uh, Professor John Van der Oost. Uh, he is my advisor for my Q1 uh, award. Okay, let me stop it here. Thank you for your attention. Okay, great. Jin Zhao, you run really fast. Yeah, I know you have a lot of things to share. Actually, uh, I'm so proud of that you already have a, a lot of, you know, customers, yeah, all over the world. So uh, we can, you know, talk about this during the panel discussion. Now I suggest all the speakers can turn on your uh, camera. So we go to the panel discussions. How? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Please. Yeah, I will do yeah. that. So, yeah, we go to the question part, Gina. Yeah, maybe I have a question for the ladies first, okay? Yeah. Uh, actually, Gina was uh, really, really interesting work. I saw several of that uh, for the microfluid chips. Yeah, so uh, you fabricate beautiful chips. So uh, the size of the, you know, the chips or the holes, you know, the wheels, you know, as, uh, um, uh, you know, 20 millimeter, 20 microns or something about that. I didn't see the scales. Yeah. yeah, for the micro wells. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those are around 20 micrometer in diameter. Um, and we're trying to add individual EV inside each micro well. And actually, the actual um, size didn't matter too much because we couldn't make extremely small for a single EV anyway. But then we used a calculation to load individual EV. So small enough to pack a lot of micro wells um, within the chip. So we actually had 10,000 micro wells per chip. Okay, good. Yeah, I saw that was a fabric that were beautifully. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, Jin Zhao, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so, may I uh, ask uh, another question? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to ask a question from uh, Dr. Yin. Uh, so, his work is more related to our devices. So, you did cool work on engineered CAS 12A and CAS 12B. Uh, before, I didn't know it started from a mistake. Uh, apparently, it, it was a good mistake. Uh, so, uh, may I ask if you want to commercialize the engineered uh, CAS 12B in the future? Uh, as you know, several companies, uh, Zhangfeng Company, uh, or company from like uh, from Dr. Wang in China, uh, they commercialize the CAS 12A and CAS 13. So, they did very good work on commercialization. Uh, do you have right. this? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah, I think it's uh, I mean, be great if it can be you know commercial out. I mean, I would say it's license out, right? So I, I'm not sure. I think this is possibly also a you know discussion here for a uh, junior PI for at me to start anything for commercialization. So it's difficult by myself. Let's say you you know from scratch to a product. I think you know really amazing to see you have uh, done a lot of you know effort to you know commercial uh the. A, a, a real product is really amazing to you know as a junior PI to to start lab and as well as uh, you know a company for me is I think my own lab is really make me exhausting. I'm pretty sure and other people like you know, Gina have the same feeling about you know to start a junior PI. So I think my best best uh guessing is to hopefully have some people to you know license it and to develop to a product. You know, to, and I definitely can fully support this, you know, commercial development. Yes, uh, it's uh, yeah, it's good idea. So uh, I I saw you uh, have two system. Uh, for your last talk, one is mm. cast B, and uh, one is the uh, room temperature uh, detection. You use cast thirteen, cast thirteen A. Oh. So it, it's also very cool. But uh, if you want go to market, uh, you want to uh, commercialize them, so which one you prefer to do first? First, Yeah, I think it's a great which question. Is better. Uh, yeah, right? Which is better? Which is better? Great question. I think possibly you may have the answer, I guess, you know, for CAS 12B, it's, uh, so lamp has been commercial for a while, I think you can say you know about it. So in particular in the Western countries and in the US uh, in particular, it's really, have matured supply chain 
and it's simple, right? So the, the enzyme is only a solo enzyme, and uh, all you need to do is to design a set of primers for this amplification. And the, when you combine, when I think Fenzan's design is really smart. We have to pick up, uh, you know, lamp as well as cast twelve B. So I think this is definitely a way to go. In particular, when engineer, uh, when we you know we have engineered a uh, very much like mutant one. So this is something you can, uh, go through a more uh, mature. I would say more. I will not say mature, but more like prepared supply chain to. Uh, make it happen and the, the cost of the production can be uh, well controlled in this case and for the room temperature i think this is interesting thing this is really what we learned from our you know previous collaborators in particular it's from the from the industrial setting so uh when they mentioned about you know, it, all this cost really you know for me it's the first time to hear about you know the cost for you know molecular diagnosis it's very they're very sensitive about the cost. It says that half dollar increase to them is huge. I would say it's huge for a uh, you know a factory manufactured for per sample. So it's huge. So so they said can do anything to relax the uh, you know the condition that we just try this and happen. But I think it's all a lot of effort to translate because how we read that a uh, signal in particular a uh, simple. If you can use a simple cell phone to read that, I guess you have shown in here, right? In the and also we can really make it happen in engine like engine tests that would be really a cool breakthrough in, in the in the uh I would say in the industry setting. I, I, it's not big a big paper, right? Not big paper out of you know it in the next step, but I think it's really cool to to make it really happen in in really make it look like an engine test. Yeah. So for usually for B and user, uh, for C and user, we usually talk about the value. For B yeah. and user, we usually uh usually every dollar counts. So yeah, right. we need to think about the cost. So so you prefer the past tell B uh system, right? Yeah, if I would say for the market for for clinical uh for clean for anything that you have a very small small machine as you show in here, right? If yeah. you want to do it in, uh, let's say, uh, small clinics, let's say, when people come in to test any virus he has, uh, you know, be infected, I think a uh, castel B based system is really cool to understand and you know, a few key viruses being, you know, being infected to cause the symptoms. So this twenty minutes and uh, simple and it can be can fast. It's not like QPCR, you know, have to do all this lab work. And but I think for the and particularly I think this is really cool because it's already demonstration. This work really well for lamp alone. It's just not the best. It's just not not the they say the optimized system. It's it's it still have 10, 10 15 percent false positive rate. And the, the primer design for a really good system is really goes through a very long way to optimization. But if we have a cast pair in it, in particular this mutant cast pair B will not sacrifice the sensitivity, but also uh, really relax the PEM design. Really simple because you can have many prime design um, options with you have Cartel B because it's really relax the specificity session. So I think it's a really cool system to go through that. But really, I think it's long term, long run. I think the real market is the family home in like in home testing. So I think you have really good niche that you design very small device to make it happen. It's, it's like it's affordable. I think it's a really affordable in a case for. For for market like in the US and potentially other countries, but for like in broad market, really the, the I think the manufacturing cost is for engine test is I think the one dollar so, or even less. So this is really amazing to have you know to have manufacturing mean, process uh, to make a cost thirteen based or anything like a room temperature based you could ask this and you know make it in broad use in the in the family testing. Yes, 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 yes. So the uh, uh, cas thirteen system, the room temperature uh, amplification, uh, it's uh, much cheaper. Uh, you, you don't need a heater, but you still need a citation light source. What you 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 use uh, in your lab usually for this? Yeah, we use a blue light, a small like a very cheap blue light to you know to oh. make it exciting. But also you can. Think about you maybe use uh you know visible light as a probe to see that light as well. And so 
for at home uh, testing scenario, uh, do you think uh, if, uh, there are some sacrifice uh, users may need to take? Uh, so I mean, uh, what are the potential disadvantage carrying carrying out reactions at room temperature compared yeah, to you uh, use a device? Right. So I think that you know the it's really so. So, so, you know, basically, I think pretty, pretty sure you are aware of this through our talk to the, I mean, to the company and China has really good, um, you know, lab, you know, better interactions with the uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese regular affair and agency. They really have very high standard for, for like SARS CoV 2, right? Really good standard, really, really a consistency and high sensitivity. And they really, really care about the contamination of the amplicons, really. I think that's, you know, so this is like all this restrict the usage of nuclear acid detection because it really amplify the nuclear acids. So, uh, so in my mind, you know, the 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 this system, if it can really be translated to a real product, I think one key part of it is to say, can you get rid of really, you know, get let's say simplify the amplification system or get rid of that, so make it happen. But so far. You know, so so our communications by the review process, actually, even some review believe that it it is never get this happen because CAS thirteen or even CAS thirteen, the dynamics cannot support this kind of uh, visible signal. So I think currently we still need a, a brief amplification of the, the the system, and at the room temperature, uh, I would say twenty degrees is great, but uh. uh RPA cannot start lower than that degree. Basically, if you have something like 15 degrees, it may not work really well. So this is, I think, the, the disadvantage of, of the, this type. Yeah, previously, I saw someone did the reaction under the arm. So maybe that's much better than uh, room temperature. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah. Someone, I think someone showed that. But really, yeah. past the regular affair, I mean, this in China is really difficult. I think pretty aware of that. It's even harder than you know, anything in, in, in Europe or in the US. So this is something I think really, you know, gave me a tough time to, you know, back to 2022 about translation, this product. It's really very, very much, you know, like strict. You have to be as good as QPCR, but not the price. I mean, the cost cannot be much higher. So this is well, very early technology, this is so difficult. Yeah. So another, the last question for you, uh, I, I ask a lot of questions. So you did very good work on protein engineering. I want to ask, uh, did you use some uh, like software or computation tools uh, for the domain analysis? Oh, that's a great question. So basically, uh, still, we when we do a single mutation, Process we just do I know by this is rational design do not require that much software right but I think yeah. I think maybe as also Gina I can can see this field of protein engineering in particular by deep learning process the alpha fold and all other um, emerging emerging models you know to uh, to see the genome to see the the protein uh, transcriptome and the protein structure uh, we rapidly in a involve in a in a, in a uh, decade, let's say this uh, protein engineering can be more efficient and uh, simpler, and uh, as well as it we can do a large scale uh, you know, screen for based on that. And I think I think we are all adopted to the uh, deep learning model in the, nowadays, and uh, all this, and even our team in our own lab, we are working on collaborators and ourselves who uh, for the initial work of deep learning, not for protein but for RNA. So I think that's definitely can have uh, an impact in the future for uh for the you know for for you can think about the protein engineering process. I think even in CRISPR field, I think not only they say about engineering a protein, but also there are a lot of researchers in CRISPR field. I think including a, a number of them in the U.S. and in China are using this pipeline in, involving also including the deep learning process to to uh to get the you know, a new protein out of the you know, nature. So this is definitely a rapid evolving process. Yeah, there is a lot of this kind of work in uh, from John Fung's lab uh, recently published. Uh, right. 
several papers uh, they they uh, published a new uh, kind of uh, it's not they, they don't call it CRISPR cas they call it a pro mm. so they call call it programmable endonuclease that's right. not uh, from uh, pro uh, uh like bacterial is from other uh, other species. Uh, I think this is definitely a rapid involved process. Yeah. So, Mac, still, I ask the question. So, I actually, I have several questions for Gina. Uh, the first one. Uh, so, because uh, I'm more interested uh, in uh, in the nucleic acid de detection. Uh, actually, uh, we are currently uh, uh, conducting uh, some fundamental research on exosomes uh, with a focus on a kind of special nucleic acid that are encapsulated in uh, EV or, or in uh, uh, exosome. Actually, we, we separated the different sites. Um, I want to ask, um, is it possible to develop a rapid test for the di discovered uh, nucleic acid biomarker? That's uh, encapsulated in exosome. So you know, exosome there are a lot of proteins on the surface. So if we uh, specific do some specific specific isolation, um, so it, it, is it possible to make it fast? Yeah. So when you mention by fast, does it mean like within an hour, within thirty minutes? Do you have any like a uh, number uh, to it? Like like. Six hour. Uh, still, we still do the work in the lab, uh, but uh, much faster. Mm. Yeah. So normally, when you work with EVs, it's pretty slow because people use like ultra centrifugation or like different um size based chromatography. You'll have to think about like what method can really isolate EVs really fast. So people have like labeled EV like using like a lipid insertion of like the click that I mentioned before. So they have like a lipid PCO um insertion. They just like they just mixed it with plasma to label the EV. And then they just add TC coated microbead and then they just pull them using microbead. So if you're using any magnetic bead or anything to capture all the EVs all together, I think that can be done pretty fast, maybe within an hour or so. Um, and then you want to think about like how to combine that isolated EV with the detection scheme. So that one, if you're going to do nucleic acid, would it be more like qPCR or any kind of like amplification that you talked about? Yeah, that's, I, I think, um, I'm just thinking some methods, you know, uh, isolate uh, the uh, EV, that take time, that take time. Also, uh, if you do some uh, nucleic purification, that also mm -hmm. uh, take time. Is it possible uh, we use some methods uh, to transfer some probe, like some detectors into the EV? Uh, mm -hmm. We use a sensitive detector mm -hmm. to see which become bright. Uh, that is the EV, uh, the mm -hmm. EV encapsulate uh, the, the target nuclear acid. Yeah, that's a pretty cool idea. So people have done um, making more like a lipid liposome hybrid. So in the liposomes, they um they pack all the cargos that can react with the ev molecules so they can have like they even also do crispr as well and then when those two make a hybrid then those can deliver those detection probe to the ev and then ev will going to provide the molecules that you are interested in and then they react to each other and then the entire ev can fluoresce and you can just measure the fluorescence right away so that study is, has been done. And I think that way you can actually expedite pretty fast. Yeah, that that's, uh, sounds uh, feasible. So uh, yeah, that, that's a good idea. Uh, another question. So I'm thinking about, uh, is it possible? So we, 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 cure, we, we care about the nucleic acid, uh, like some lung, 
uh, long DNA sequence, uh, such as like 10 KB, this length, mm -hmm. uh, that encapsulated in EV. Do you think uh, the AFM, the atomic force microscopy, is it possible to use AFM directly observe the the lung strength in EV directly? Is it possible? Um, you mean to look at the long sequence DNA inside yeah. the EV? Yeah, inside the EV, yeah. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but also I'm not really sure if they're gonna be like long DNA sequences in the EV because what are mostly known is that all the RNA or DNA is fragmented because the EV mm. is really small. So that might be the first question, like do we see those long DNA sequence from the EV? And if we do, um uh, what's the prevalence? Like how many do we have? because usually nucleic acid, there are not that many inside the EV. For the AFM, that's a really interesting idea. I haven't thought about it, but. Yeah, I saw someone, they use the, the AFM to observe the, the lung string DNA directly, but mm -hmm. I didn't see someone directly mm -hmm. uh, to observe the encapsulated uh, DNA, mm -hmm. lung DNA. Mm. So, so maybe we, we can we can have a try in the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I okay, so, Jing Zhao. Maybe yeah. I come to ask you a question. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I uh, I know you are uh, working really uh you know fifteen years experience and then now you also engage in a startup right yeah. Yes. to uh, translate all yeah commercialize all these you know a uh, super ideas so can you tell us a uh, difference uh you know from a scientist and to be an entrepreneur uh so i think that's not too much difference uh there is not too much difference uh because um our research uh mostly uh, we we spend eighty percent time on the application uh, research, uh, twenty percent on fundamental research. Uh, when we have a, a a project, mostly we uh, our idea to make it to be a product in the future. So we do the same thing as uh, R D R and D department uh, in a company. So we don't think think that there, that there is a difference so you know um so we need to get uh, funding from the like china csf like like some uh government department uh, uh, right yeah yeah in, in, in fsc so we also need we can also get some uh, funding support from the the technology translation transformation uh, yeah, so we, we need we need this. Uh, we don't think that too much difference. Okay, great. I think you know uh, many many young scientists here listen to that. So this also can be one approach. You got is a product driven research, right? Not yeah, a research driven. Yeah. So not, not paper driven. I mean. Not paper drum, yes, yeah, yeah. paper drum. So, <laughs> so actually, we driving, have yes. some, uh, we have some papers, but we, I don't. So, I the the only difference, I I don't have enough time to publish paper. So we have a lot <laughs> of things to publish, but firstly, we need to to patent it, and then we make products. Uh, in when I'm free, I spend time to write a paper. So that's the only difference. Oh. Okay, that's like a byproduct, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, super. Yeah, uh, Jin Zhao, uh, another question for you is, I saw you already have, uh, you know, many customers from the international, you know, uh, you know, different countries, areas, or continentals. So uh, how is the business are going like this? You know, you have a good connection or you have, a, you know, super professional teams to do that? Uh, actually, most of our international uh, uh, customers uh, uh, from uh, my 
we we did we did uh, we drawn the uh, international exhibition, so we get some customers. And previously, we have some collaborators. Uh, during the pandemic, we have a group, G Lamp Group. That's a uh, international all all the world scientists working on this field. They have the group. That's a professor from Cornell, uh, Cornell University. They built this uh, group. So when I send an email, so they are all interested in this product. Uh, so very easy for me to get the connection. Uh, yeah, yeah. Another, another, uh, another way is we publish papers. So they they. Uh, contact uh, with us uh, after, uh, say, the published paper. Just recently, uh, some company uh, saw we uh, saw uh, uh, get the, our newly published uh, the online paper. So they come to buy the product uh, like VD one. They're very interested. So that's three ways: published paper and uh, the the group, international group, and the John uh, international. Uh, exhibition. Wow, super. Yeah, great to know that, uh, you know, the internet, you know, the network was built up during COVID-19. As I can ask, it's also built up during COVID-19 to connect yeah. the scientists globally. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, so nice to, you know, know three of you here. So as uh, my opportunity, you know, uh, so as a moderator to ask three of you a question, so, I mean, you know, after you uh, get independent, uh, both, uh, all of you has, uh, you know, uh, grow up very quickly in your own direction. So, uh, can you give some uh, comments or suggestions to the audience? Yeah, they are waiting for, because, you know, many people don't know how to find a good direction. Yeah, many, many choice, they, they don't know which one is the best. So how you decided that, how, how you, you know, found your direction? So, Gina, you go first or Gina? Uh, maybe Gina, G Gina, yeah, lady first. Please. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure, <laughs> I can go first. Um, yeah, so for me, I think the easiest option is just you just like keep working on what you did during your postdoc. Um, but also I wanted to develop a new field that we are also working on in our lab. So I think that really helped me to transition while working on some work that I'm familiar with, but also just willing to start new different fields. That's why we are working on spatial transcriptomics, also like EV-based therapeutics. So I think that really opened up different opportunities for me and also recruiting awesome students and postdocs who are going to bring their own expertise and really make the field go really far. So that really helped as well. Okay, so uh, Jin Zhaoyu. Yes, yeah, so uh, for the independence you uh, you talk about, uh, I think um, when I am in uh, pen engineering, um, I think the NIH uh, system, uh, there is some benefit uh, I, I got from the, there. They have the mechanism like for young scientists, they have an NIH, they want the key series, uh, the career development uh, awards. Like Gina get a K99, uh, I, I applied a, a K01. So during the application and the, the grant, they, uh, we need to get the mentor and the advisor. So during the first two years for this grant, uh, I almost get 80% uh, uh, of independent. Uh, when I come back to, to China, so the first year is very hard, you know, to Found to 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 get postdoc to get students, uh, so to learn to to let them to taught them learn from zero. Even the pipetting, I need to taught to taught them. Uh, but after the team built up, uh, I spend less time on the 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 teaching on the handwork. So because the senior can teach 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 junior, um, so. I, I think uh, I get benefit from NIH, uh, uh, the, 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 the foundation. 
Yeah, that, that's it. Okay, that's good to know. I know mentorship is very, very important for the young, you know, PI. So many, many, you know, the very senior uh, professors are, you know, with their experience, they really can help a lot. Yeah. So how any comments on this? Uh, you yeah. Okay. Right. So senior, senior mentorship, right, about doing like the, the during the for junior PI, so I definitely have some uh, mentorship from our uh, institute director at Wuhan University. Really give a lot. I think he he's I would say he is really give a lot of you know pushes about let's say how to um do uh good science in particular in a way let's say you have to do something uh, very different from other people in the field. Otherwise, it's difficult to. To be uh to stand out, I would say you know to stand out means I say you what do you have done. I think possibly what I learned from you know those those people and senior professors in at some different department of Wuhan University as well as during my you know uh, faculty searching process is the field is uh, with and with your research will be different. That's the, that's the one criteria for uh for successful a junior PI. To uh to uh to establish, so this is what I try to do uh in the past six years, which we do have some unpublished studies. Uh, we try to uh our best to avoid so everyone doing like everyone is doing some you know um you know digging out new systems. Possibly I will try to uh avoid this uh process. Otherwise, you have possibly you know compete with eighty different peoples uh in the world. And that it's difficult to actually to compete, you know, eighty smart smart people, a smart group in the world to you know stand out. So pick up a, a direction which uh people know nothing about it, and uh, people will maybe ignore this. And but it's very important as well. So it will be a, a key for initiating to initiate a project. And also, uh, also another thing I'm not trying to emphasize is really. This very beginning of initiation is not started at the very beginning of the year of the junior faculty, right? So first year one of the junior faculty, as also Dr. So mentioned, uh, this is just to establish uh, a lab and uh, setting up, you know, every equipment, teach how to junior students or even junior postdoc how to do experiment, in, even including some pipetting, you know, teaching how to pipetting. So this is definitely maybe not the very beginning thing about, but once the lab is start ongoing. This is I spend a lot of effort to think about what's the future of my lab to, for now to uh, ten years from now, and uh, what is my major achievement I want to get in the next ten years to for the field and uh, and what I'm interested in and uh, how can I do that? And I think definitely this I uh, we got a lot of interesting work on on, on the cooking and on the you know, on the revision and how hope we can get it. Uh, you know, next uh, one or two years to you know to be uh, a really to get a really interesting direction uh, done uh, at least ongoing uh, for the for the gene editing field. So what's what's what I'm talking about? Okay, super super. Yeah, huh? Uh, you comments is very important. I think it really encourage a lot of young generations, you know, to get more chance to be independent. So, uh, Jin Zhao, uh, as the time is approaching, maybe we should close the panel discussion here. I think many questions can be discussed downstairs. Yeah, so I'm going to share my screen and, uh, okay, yeah, my hair. So, uh, can you see my slides now? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, as you are so proud of your talk, so I give you this e certification. So, how? Yeah, we proud of you. Uh, did such a nice talk, and I will send to oh, you an email. Okay. Yeah. Thank so, you very much. Uh, yeah, Gina, that's for you. Yeah, I already got a few of your colleagues connect me on LinkedIn. So they're proud of you too. Yeah. So, uh, you. Jin Zhao, yeah, this is the second, second one for you, right? Yeah, <laughs> you nice already you, got, a, you know, yeah, a, a Chinese version last time, this time with English version. Uh, so, yeah. uh, great. Yeah. 
So, uh, before I end up the uh, session, I'm going to introduce our I can Act Double Summit, get my invitation, you know, to go to this big event. Uh, as uh, this will be at July 11 to 12 in Davos, Switzerland. Everyone knows that Davos, you know, economy summit, but uh, you, this was the first time to have a science summit. So we proud of, of that. We being, you know, a new uh, big event there. So uh, this is a place where beautiful in the summer, uh, amazing, you know, green lands, uh, many, many things, you just go Switzerland. And more importantly, we have the plenary speakers who was really top. So we have Nobel laureates, we have a president of academia and university, we have the top of figures in, you know, many, many fields. Uh, uh, we have a highlight forums, the Nobel Laureate Forum, President of Academy Forum, and the President of University Level Forum. And uh, we have uh, many uh, parallel sessions. So, uh, you know, bioengineering and uh, all this technology uh, should be one part of this. So be sure to get more friends to come and uh, more friends to discuss of this. We call calling for the speakers. Yeah, so uh, it's a good opportunity for this. And uh, we also have uh, several awards is for, you know, uh, the young generations. First, the innovation award, this is called for the college level, the students who have a innovation project and uh, who is, uh, you know, very good innovators. And the young scientist award is right for three of you because we got to be highlight the independent young PIs. So all of you are, you know, uh, uh, you might need to be apply for this. That will be a big, big party for the young scientists to celebrate together. And uh, we also have a uh, future entrepreneurs for the startup awards. So Jin Dao, yeah, you should think about that possibly. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know? okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. So this was awards, but more than that, we have many, many things to share. You know, uh, talks, you know, so talents and many disciplinary talks, amazing the programs. Yeah, see here is the most attractive part. So we have a good qualified social events. We'll have a gala dinner on the top of the mountain as uh, all the palace over 100 years, yeah, maybe 20 years. So a lot of amazing stuff there. We'll have uh, another one as the only one you can see here is I can ask the Jesse party. So this Jesse party was from the scientists, the Jesse Bond, and also the super, you know, stars in this stage. So there will be a big, big surprise for everyone. So welcome to join this and uh, Let's go to Davos, you know, science, innovation, science, technology, investment, management, entrepreneurship. So it's, it's time to go Davos. Welcome everyone. And the next week we go have another, you know, uh, faculty members here, three of them from different part of the world to talk about advanced plus, uh, plasma technology and the devices. So uh, if you're interested, follow us on I Can Add to the Use Tax. So that's all for today. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. Good. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye-bye, Gina. Yeah, bye. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Yeah, bye. bye. Chinese人，亲爱的朋友们，欢迎大家来参加我们的iCanX大沃斯科学峰会。那今年是第一次iCanX会组织大家一起在瑞士的达沃斯进行线下的聚会，我们有六个主要的议题。第一个是创新innov
给我们启发的关于未来的这些报告，在达沃斯我们会有三个非常重要的论坛，一个是诺贝尔奖论坛，我们会邀请诺贝尔奖获得者来跟我们谈科学的未来；我们会邀请世界科学院的院长来跟我们谈世界科学技术发展的未来；那我们会邀请大学校长来参加我们世界大学校长论坛，来跟我们谈关于教育的。创新教育的这样的一个未来，同时呢，在达沃斯呢，我们也会邀请各行各业的这样的一个非常重要的领袖人物、领军人物来跟我们分享他们的所思所想，他们对未来的思考。那我们也会邀请非常多的各行各业的精英来跟我们分享他最最。精华的这样的一个思想，那当然了，达沃斯这个舞台也不只是给这些大牛们展示的舞台，也是我们来展示的这样一个舞台。所以，如果你有好的故事、好的思想、好的技术、好的思考来进行分享，那也欢迎你。在来线上投稿，所以我们的截止时间是四月一号，大家还有还一个月的时间来准备好你的发言，希望分享给全世界的，所以欢迎你在线提供你的资料。那我们也希望你成为这个舞台上的明星。那在达沃斯呢，我们设了三个奖。第一个是针对大学生的，你是创新创业的最牛的大学生，那你来申请我们的创新奖。如果你是一个毕业十年以内，现在正在从事独立科研工作的科学家，那你来申请我们的青年科学家奖。如果你是一个创业者，你成立了你的公司还不到五年的时间，已经发展的非常好，那请你来申请我们的创业奖。所以，所有的奖项申请的时间截止都是四月一号。那欢迎大家在线提供这样的一些资料，那我们也会给大家非常多的这样的机会，成为舞台上最亮的星。那是时候来，我们大家一起把科学推向未来，推向世界。那这个呢，是我们在达沃斯的非常非常重要的合作伙伴。我也希望你成为我们的合作伙伴，我们一起来推动世界的发展。那现在达沃斯开论坛已经开始注册了，所以各位朋友、各位好朋友们，请你们开始尽快注册吧！我们相聚在达沃斯，我们一起 Go 3。